uh, practical applications of progressive matrices are almost universally unethical. The uses to which it is put for practical purposes have the effect of creating differentiation and legitimizing differentiation within society, within schools, by making invisible many of the talents that people possess. By focusing on this one thing, you make other things invisible. In fact, it's worse than that, because by removing these wider components of competence from schooling, you create a recursive situation in which the talents are rendered invisible. Because they're invisible, nothing is done to nurture them. And this reinforces this concept of general intelligence. So it is an emergent, creative, co-creative process in which you create both the environments and the individual characteristics. You create this co-creative process in which you create the environment, which in turn creates the individual characteristic, which in turn uh, creates an environment. Right, so this guy, Devonshire, is talking about trying to get some discussion, some agreement, believe it or not, about the abuses of um, intelligence. And so I started writing from hey, this is going to be very difficult because this book that we produced has a chapter which is called Intelligence Engineered Invisibility and the Destruction of Life on Earth. Now you may think those have got nothing to do with each other, but in fact they have everything to do with each other. By rendering other talents invisible, one creates a hierarchical society which depends on, for the hierarchy, on compelling participation in the hierarchy by manufacturing all sorts of senseless things like junk foods, junk cars, junk insurance, junk security systems and so on. And those things by requiring people <coughs> to justify their existence by contributing to the production and distribution of those things actually ends up uh, creating uh, an environment by destroying our habitat is destroying any chance that the human species will survive. So it's anything but intelligent. It's the production of a process which is rendering invisible the most important talents and values that are required if we are to survive as a species. So it's a highly um, very negative process. But nobody, but nobody refers to this chapter. This is why the book was called Uses and Abuses of Intelligence, because here is a huge abuse of a psychological construct, which in research terms has proved extremely useful. So if you take a classical work on, on so-called intelligence, incidentally, uh, the originator of this general fact is a person who was discovered it was Charles Spearman, and he refused to use the word intelligence because it is so slippery and changes from one use to another as people go through the same argument, argument never mind from one person to another. So he spoke about uh, G, a general factor, and G made up two components, one of which he called eductability the ability to make sense of confusion. In modern terms, the ability to engage in systems thinking and think about things that have not been made explicit before and see connections between them. And this systems thinking, in fact, becomes very important in any kind of uh, societal organization and management and so on. And the other he called reproductive ability, the ability to reproduce information that has been made explicit by other people. Now, given this framework, which has been incorrectly termed fluid and crystallized intelligence, because one is not a crystallized form of the other, they're entirely different abilities that were very close together most of the time, um, one has got some remarkable results. For example, 
two thirds of the variance in scores is within family variance. So when people start talking about the importance of family background, they need to watch their step because the variance is largely within, between brothers and sisters in the same family. <coughs> Likewise, these scores on 11 year olds, scores on these tests, correlate 0.89 with their scores on the same tests taken when they're 70 and 80 years old. So there is an enormous quote, reliability in these measures over the lifespan. These measures also predict things like, very markedly predict, longevity, how long people will live, and many of the things that are meant to be a product of midlife experience turn out to disappear if you take out the effects of their 11-year-old test scores, because it then turns out that their midlife experiences are themselves being created but as an effect of their 11-year-old test scores and the implications of those through the educational system and so on. So there are some really remarkable results. Um, one of the most uh, common ones is the uh, of all the things that predict occupational performance, the occupational performance is a minefield. Assessing occupational form performance is a disaster area because it doesn't register most of the contributions that people make to their organizations. They don't show up in the criteria and measures that are used to assess performance. But if you use the standard criteria of occupational performance, the only one, the only one that significantly predicts occupational performance is this G score and the correlation is about 0.3, about 10% of the variance. If you take G out of many of the other test predictions that are said to work, their additional uh, predictive power is zero. So you get this G having enormous power. Equally, eductive ability but not reproductive ability has been increasing dramatically over the years. So that 50% of our grandparents would be put in special education classes if they were judged against today's norms. There has been a dramatic increase in inductive ability, but not reproductive ability scores. Now, it's reproductive ability scores that would be influenced by education, for example. So the explanation of this score is not education. Height has also been increasing over all this time. It is not explained by any of the things that you'd expect to predict increases in height, like diet or any of these things. These reductions, these explanations of increases in height don't work. The explanation is a systemic, an improvement in a system, a function of a system over time. And this is what is being reflected in these increases in G scores. So one's attempt to get reductionist explanations of important psychological phenomenon falls down in the same way. So what I'm saying is, yeah, there have been some very important uh, results from work with this G factor. Oh, I said, yeah, it's increasing over time. But the interesting thing is that in most cultures, at any point in time, the scores are the same, whether the countries have got different education systems, different family sizes, Ninja systems, different economic conditions, they're remarkably similar. They're not identical. <coughs> but the scores, as again in this book, the scores of uh, people living in tribal areas of India, where they have no permanent houses, where there's no financial system, where there's virtually no educational system, those scores are very similar in mean and standard deviation to the scores of urban India, living in Calcutta. Uh, so the, 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 you would, one would expect that given the change over the time, there would be big differences between people living in these different kinds of environments. Not so. The normal explanations of the increase to do with education, health care, level of economic development and so on, don't work. So, here is a huge effect of the environment on these scores, but not the aspects of the environment that most people will go running after. So I'm not saying therefore that uh, 
nothing has come out of this enterprise with this general factor of intelligence. I am saying that it has nevertheless done enormous damage. And in fact, um, uh, Charles Spearman, at the same time as he um, identified this general factor, wrote that neither G nor the tests from which it had emerged, that is to say the normal measures of reading, writing, arithmetic, language performance, mathematical performance, neither G nor those tests had any place in schools. I think that the reason why this whole measurement thing starts is because there are this mass production thing. It's easier to measure things than actually talk to people and, and consider their real talents. Every normal man, woman and child is a genius at something. The problem is to identify at what. This cannot be done with any <coughs> of the assessment procedures in current usage. But I am satisfied they are capable of great improvement. The question then is, what do you think of that statement? Why has there been no attention devoted to thinking about or developing ways of thinking about individual students' talents and how to nurture them over a century? Why have we now got a situation in which about one-third of the pupils demonstrate for 50 years of having worked, about one-third of students are seriously damaged by the education system. They're made to feel failures, incompetent, and so on. They don't change their minds as they grow up. We've interviewed them again when they're 30 years old. They still haven't changed their mind. The institutions that are called school do not merit the name academic because they do not encourage thinking, they do not encourage the analysis of argument, they do not merit the description as a academic institution, they do not merit description as developmental organizations. And yet this situation, the statistics have been around for 50 years, in country after country after country. And yet nothing is done about these one third of pupils who in country after country after country are cooped up in these institutions, made to perform activities that they and everybody else do are very little value to them. They don't change their mind, they don't become valuable to them later. Some upwardly mobile students use their qualifications to get jobs, but even they don't use what they've studied in schools, in their jobs, or in their lives. So you've got a situation where you've got, who was talking about the system's qualification and getting process. That has nothing to, it has to do with the social regulation process, and not to do with the developmental <coughs> process. I'm not sure whether that's quite what the last time you might talk about a kind of factory system, but that, that is actually what you've got. It's a system, it's a, a sociological system of legitimizing and compelling participation in a hierarchical process. And this hierarchical process, in the end, becomes deeply destructive of any chances of our survival as a future, because it compels everybody to participate in these productive activities that do not defer, do, do, do not confer a high quality of life. Quality, high quality of life comes from all sorts of quite other things to do with things like networks of friends, people who will support you in times of difficulty, these kind of things. Uh, it has to do with, in a sense, public provision, the absence of plague, uh, avoidance of being caught up in crime and so on, these kind of public provisions that are not part of the market process and cannot be bought and sold as an individual. They're part of social provision and so on, and very little dependent on the production of all these things that depend on mining uh, metals and so on and disposing of all the products of mining and disposing of the products of 
production, byproduct of production, disposing of the, the outcomes, the cars, the plastic bags, and all the rest of come out at the end. So we've got the whole process concerned with hierarchy, with the manufacturing, creation, and perpetuation of hierarchy, which is counter to anything that is productive in developmental terms, anything that is useful in quality of life terms, and this going on. So, at the basis of all this, one now has a very basic um, theme. What is this process that has, over many millennia, as one moves from societies in the Kalash Valley, where again there is the hierarchy, the education systems, the exchange in the world, and so on, there is no little hierarchy. Okay? Across the centuries, these, these are, some of these societies are still there in the Himalaya and the Amazon and so on, they come to life. But by and large, across all societies, this drift toward hierarchy, toward destruction, to the creation of demeaning environments in which people are kicked in the teeth and made to feel inferior because they do not participate in the construction of pyramids and all sorts of things which are very little use to anybody. So you've got this hierarchy gone. What is the persistent process that lies behind this persistent creation and recreation of hierarchy? And how does it get embedded in production systems, education systems, so that it becomes part of a self creating self perpetuating process? The, the, the industrial hierarchy, that's not the right word, compels participation in itself. It exacerbates this production of senseless good and it compels people to participate in it in order to avoid the consequences of not doing so. But the very, very basic question now moves away from GMs on what are what are the processes behind this? Why is it that over a century? Essentially nothing has been done by psychologists about this enormously destructive process that takes place in so-called schools. Why is it that psychologists have not developed alternative ways of thinking about multiple talents and how they can be nurtured, in spite of the fact that in homes and workplaces and societies, it emerges in time after time after time that these multiple talents um, are essential. So if you look, for example, at the work of uh, Rosalind Cantor on uh, innovation and change in organizations, you find that those innovations come not from separate cargoes of researchers. They come from everybody in the organization participating in very different ways in group organized activities around some problem, some relatively inarticulate person noticed. And then you need somebody who publicizes the problem, somebody who gets other people together to work on it, somebody who engages in the industrial espionage to find out what other people are doing about it, somebody who can pour oil on troubled waters as these people in these so-called teams fight with each other. And these emergent teams arise in collapsing around emergent and continuous problems. So we are seeing actually this notion of multiple talents is essential and built into social function, but is obliterated by most of the criteria used by human resource, resource personnel and managers and public thinking about recruitment and so on, what is a, what is a legitimate way for organizations to go about hiring individuals? How are they to find out about the particular motives and talents of individuals and create situations in which they can develop those competencies and become part of the network-based working arrangements?